First, let me thank you, Daryl, for uh, doing the housekeeping and the continuing continuing education team for all the hard work that they do to help these webinars run smoothly. Um, so welcome, everyone. My name is Brittany Wright. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the Community Engagement Consultant for the Bureau of Library Development within the Division of Library and Information Services. Um, so today we are going to hear about financial beginnings from uh, James Chen, who's going to explain uh, what they do, their financial literacy courses, and how that will be relevant for libraries. So at this time, I will uh, pass it on to you, James. Great. Thank you so much, Daryl uh, and Brittany as well for your help through all this way. Um, for everyone else, uh, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to attend this webinar. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, we're slated for about an hour. Um, we probably won't take up all that time. Um, th this orientation is really a way for all of you to get uh, familiar, acclimated, scratch the surface, if you will, of financial beginnings and how the programs that we offer as really to financial education can possibly benefit uh, the constituents that you serve um, at the library. Uh, just kind of clarification on host, um, it's more inter internal language at Financial Beginnings. Uh, host are individuals who we call as um, people that invite us in. So you're our host, essentially, or potential host. Um, and so uh, this is just, again, just a, a language that we use internally that could mean, um, in your case, uh, library staff, uh, state officials, teachers, and educators. So. Um, I guess I, I'll go ahead and get started with uh, introductions. I at least you know who I am, what I look like, but uh, my name is James Chen. Um, I, I'm with Financial Beginnings. I'm actually based in Los Angeles, so you're kind of in the future, I guess you could say. Um, so financial literacy curriculum standards really essentially vary from state to state. Uh, and so Florida, where you're all based in, fares better than many requiring schools to provide a course in personal finance. Um, however, there is no standalone course um, at most uh, high schools and personal finance topics are really folded into the high school curriculum, typically an economics class or a mathematics class or even like a career and pathway development. We also partner with community-based organizations um, who provide regular program offerings uh, again to the constituents, individuals in the community, um, and usually financial education kind of falls under like a life skill type of package. Um, or a April of every month is financial literacy or financial education month. And so that's where we also have a good entry point. Uh, October is typically known as Get Smart About Credit. And so we have a lot of credit uh, topics uh, and workshops being administered during that month as well. So just something to keep in mind. Um, as I was saying uh, with, with Florida, uh, there's the inconsistent kind of delivery because they really leave it up to kind of the teacher to deliver the content. Um, and so that's where Financial Beginning steps in. So our mission is simple. It's to empower our communities to take control of their financial future. So we work with schools, nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations um, to provide standalone classes or workshops and subjects as, such as banking, budgeting, credit, and investment. Um, so, uh, today, um, I'm going to briefly go over the, you know, who Financial Beginnings is, so at least you get an idea who you potentially are partnering up with. Um, the impact that we've done, we've been around for almost 16 years now, so I want to cover kind of some high-level overview of the work we've done. The program offerings uh, that we have, um, and I think specifically kind of for your audiences, um, we go from as young uh, of target audience of elementary students all the way to middle school, high school, college students and even to adults. So um, our, our program offerings are definitely covered the entire spectrum there. I'll talk about what it means uh, for you and what to expect if you do partner with Financial Beginnings um, as a host. So what are our roles and responsibilities, our divisions of duties? Um, I'll also talk to you about our, uh, our, our portal, or our dashboard, uh, which allows you access to kind of request classroom opportunities, um, pull up a history of uh, offering that you've helped coordinate and then lastly kind of next steps for uh, all of you so you know back earlier we talked about uh different well for florida kind of where you stood and that uh, there are uh, financial education topics embedded into some of the high school curriculum and so just in general um there was a study done a few years back from champlain college's national report card um, and they essentially uh, took a look at um, 
our, our national kind of core competencies, our standards and all that. And they graded all 50 states and the District of Columbia on their efforts to produce financially literate high school graduates. And so uh, on this next screen here, uh, Florida actually got a B, which is really good. And if you can look at the kind of the color spectrum uh, here. Um, I, I have California kind of popped out here because that's where I'm based, as I mentioned. <laughs> you know, we have an F, so we have a lot of work to do. But we're at least in Florida, um, you're ahead of the curve, so to speak. Um, you know, what this grading shows and the color grading from one side of one part of the country to the next is that we have a long way to go before. Um, we are all essentially a financially educated, financially literate nation. So uh, only five states, uh, just for any of you who are curious, only five states received a, a letter A grade, and that's Utah, Missouri, Tennessee, Alabama, and Virginia. So um, again, it's a lot of measure of how much financial education is incorporated into the high school um, curriculum. Is it a required or is it an optional, things of that nature. And so uh, that was a previous study that was uh, conducted a few years back. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, financial beginnings. Uh, our, our our mission is is simple. Um, programs like ours exist to really complement um, existing curricula. Let's say at the school level, um, or if there isn't any, to provide that foundation. And the, really, the goal is to improve the lives of um, the community, the people who live in our communities, whether it's in California or Florida or across the nation. Um, but just generally, people who may not have ready access to financial education. A lot of the programs that we do at a community-based organization level, um, you know, we understand that uh, individuals who live in underserved, underrepresented communities, uh, maybe not might not have that role model in their lives who uh, is financially educated. Um, speaking for California, at least in Los Angeles, we ha have a large immigrant population, right? And so um, a lot of immigrants um, are coming from countries where maybe there's a, a distrust of the financial system there. Uh, or maybe just the, the system here in the United States is different, right? Um, not a lot of countries have, you know, like a FICO credit score measurement um, to determine kind of credit accessibility. And so a lot of new products and services that individuals are not uh, familiar with. And so um, we, in order for us to help empower youth and adults to take control of their financial futures, we do this by organizing uh, classes and workshops, again, at schools and nonprofit organizations. Um, here in Los Angeles, again, as an example, we are partnered up with the uh, Los Angeles Public uh, Library Network. Um, so we're, uh, in that sense, we're familiar with kind of how the, the, the template could possibly look. We know that Florida library system has different nuances um, as well and different audiences and demographics. Um, but just wanted to share that because uh, we do have a partnership here um, with our local network. And so um, we're definitely looking forward to the opportunity to work with all of you too. Uh, some just quick history for the history bus, if there are any out here with me. Um, uh, financial Beings was established back in 2005, so we're 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 approaching our 16-year uh, anniversary this September. Uh, we actually had a really, uh, you know, 15-year anniversary event planned last year, but we all know what happened, and so that is going to be folded into our 16th year anniversary. Um, our CEO and founder, her name is Dr. Melody Bell. And uh, she founded the organization back in 2005, where our, our, our national headquarters is in Portland. Um, she founded the organization after uh, putting herself through college and working in um, collections. And so uh, she, uh, hopefully you never got these calls, but if you did, you will understand. Um, she worked for a collection agency for a, a retail outlet, kind of like a, a Macy's and, or Target. And uh, she had to be the ones to make those calls to ask uh, for payment, right? And she had thought to herself uh, several times over and many times over the, the weeks, months, and years, and just thought, you know, how do people get into um, this predicament? And, you know, part of it is the understanding of, you know, life happens and a lot of things are out of your control. But the other part of it is also um, a lot of times uh, things like credit cards are, are, are being, uh, advertise or market to an audience who have little understanding of how it works, right? Uh, a lot of the uh, students that I've talked to before think a credit card is, um, you know, like a debit card, right? And it's connected to a bank account. Um, others have thought, you know, that it's free money, right? Um, and so it all depends on kind of their financial understanding and knowledge. Um, and so 
I'm sure all of you to some extent have gone shopping and someone will say at the register, you know, do you want to save 10 to 20% off your purchase today? And of course, all of us are like, who wouldn't want to save money? Um, but little do they know, and of course, probably you know now, but little do these individuals know, um, they're, they're signing up for a credit card, right? And so um, a lot of the, the, the kind of the, the mission for what Dr. Melody Bell founded the organization on is this financial preparation, is this understanding um, of these these topics so that when the time comes around, it's not completely foreign. Um, and everyone has different levels of understanding when it comes to financial education and everyone's at different points in their lives. Um, but the hope is that we can provide that foundation so that as the individual gets uh, more kind of real life experience that they can continue building upon that. Um, so we started off in Portland, but uh, in 2014, uh, uh, um, we started um, expanding out. And so we have an office in um, Seattle, Washington. Um, in 2017, we decided to even go farther out of the Pacific Northwest. And so we opened up our uh, California office last February, um, right before the pandemic, um, and then Nebraska uh, last July during the pandemic. So uh, real interesting uh, in the sense of timing. Um, but I think uh, as many of you, as if you read the news and whatnot, um, a, a lot of uh, individuals um, were, were having were dealing with a lot of challenges financially, right? And so um, a, a lot of um, kind of the idea of financial education became more prominent again. Um, here is a, a timeline, um, uh, just a quick snapshot of our history um, above the uh, individuals here. Um, is the number of program participants served. And so it, it pretty much grows exponentially over the years, um, whether it's us creating new uh, program content. Um, we started off with a high school curriculum and then we started expanding out to elementary school, middle school, um, college students and so on. Um, through the years, increased uh, audience served through uh, partnerships, uh, similar to uh, what, we, what we might have with you um, in Florida. Um, 20, but one thing I always point out is between 2010, 2011, the, the, the growth from about 4,000 program participants served all the way up to 11,000. Um, we, uh, we, I, I guess you could say we were proud of kind of where we stand in terms of technology and harnessing the resources that and efficiencies that came with technology. So between 2010, 2011, we um, created a, a, a content management system uh, or CMS for short. Um, where we can manage uh, multiple contacts internally um, and um, push external messaging out. So before we were using like Excel and the office suite and email, and then a lot of automation came around uh, between those two years there. Uh, so, right. Um, just another kind of slide here to talk about the impact that we've done. So we do pre and post tests or assessments, I should say. Um, we, we, we inquire about our audience as it relates to these five core topics um, that we have. Um, and then we kind of look over uh, kind of improvements um, between kind of behavioral changes um, or content knowledge as well. And so to kind of drill down a little bit on what you just saw earlier, um, we, we, we've done some longitudinal studies, uh, basically six months thereafter, um, they go through our programs um, and we ask these questions here. And so um, the, the percentage you see here is essentially individuals um, who um, became more financially knowledgeable about things such as understanding of how to access their credit report or um, were able to actually increase their overall savings, uh, thought about retirement, long-term goals, and whatnot. Um, so these are just some of the kind of program impact uh, outcomes that I want, we wanted to share with you. Um, so one of the things, and you don't necessarily have to type this in into your in your, in your chat box or anything, um, but uh, you know, think back to what your first money-related memory or significant mem memory was. Um, and the reason for that is um, this kind of this next slide here, and this is the framework for financial beginnings and our approach. Um, and so I asked this question really to help um, you kind of think about your earliest money related experience uh, and you know, whether uh, it was um, you know, influenced by your family, your ethnicity, your religion, your faith, or any general communities. Um, uh, and we know that uh, you know, all of these uh, factors are essentially drivers that shape the associations we have with money. Um, 
examples of, of things I've talked to uh, our participants are about, uh, again, like the immigrant population, uh, they'll say, my parents, you know, never taught me about money. Um, and so, you know, I, will, I don't have a bank account or we just kind of save money at home. Um, so a, a lot of different factors uh, in kind of our upbringing obviously kind of affect our sentiment and our feelings about money, right? And so because of that, it also affects the financial decisions we make. Um, and then uh, as a result, of course, it impacts the financial actions we take as well. And so uh, you know, this process is really universal and it really drives our financial values, beliefs and behavior. Um, this is really true for all of us here um, and also the individuals you serve in the library network, right? And so um, this is really significant because every person you will work with will come with their own unique cultural influence, basically their own prior knowledge and experience. Um, as, as it relates to financial uh, values, beliefs, and behaviors. And so just simply uh, you, you really being able to understand and appreciate kind of this uniqueness uh, will really make for a more successful kind of experience. Um, and this is something we, we also uh, train our volunteer presenters on. Um, uh, these, these volunteers are typically individuals who come from the financial services industry, uh, bankers, accountants, financial planners, things of that, or individuals of that nature. And so we let them know, you know, the, the, the audience that they see really come from all walks of life, have different levels of understanding. And so we want to meet uh, these individuals where they are the best we can, at least. So some of the values that we hope uh, individuals would go through our program uh, are in part are what you see here. And so, um, you know, grounded in financial beginnings values, um, our volunteer guest speakers facilitate our classes um, using their own understanding of their own financial values, beliefs, and behaviors. And so, as I mentioned, um, during the training for our volunteer presenters, we definitely make sure that we drive that home. Um, our program is really designed to break the stigma of silence around talking about money by facilitating conversations with youth and adults about how they can work toward economic self-sufficiency. Um, our, our curriculum is something we built in-house um, and we align it with uh, the Jumpstart National Standards for Financial Education and, and Jumpstart's another community-based organization um, that looks at the, the, the standards um, at uh, different school districts across the country. Um, and they kind of distill it down to um, what uh, the, the standard should be for financial education. So we uh, lean on that. And then, uh, so it, as mentioned kind of earlier with the different maps or different state map on the map that we saw, um, our, um, each, each state has their own standards, right? And, and, and you, they got the letter A, B, C, D, and F. And so um, our curriculum that we build in-house um, uh, either meets or exceeds um, those state standards to provide accessible, unbiased financial education, and really to uh, promote equitable economic advancement for everyone. And so uh, we intentionally build our curriculum to be interactive, um, include engaging activities, um, and again, um, serving the entire spectrum from youth to uh, young adults and young adults thereafter as well. Uh, and so uh, hopefully, uh, again, there'll, there'll be an opportunity for us to partner here. Um, and so your, your support of our work will help us kind of get financial education um, and that, that knowledge uh, built out for the constituents that you serve. Um, so we, we do have kind of what you call special names, I guess you could say for uh, our curriculum and you can see it here, but um, our programs are always offered at no cost to participants, schools, community-based organizations, libraries. <laughs> uh, we are able to do this because of uh, our volunteers uh, who help us do it. I mean, I, I, I obviously can't travel to Florida if you need in person. And so that's why we have a volunteer network actually um, based out there, um, more highly concentrated in Tampa. Um, but we can talk more about that later on in terms of kind of program delivery, whether it's in person or virtual. Um, as mentioned, uh, we offer programs for all age groups, from elementary to elderly, um, but currently our greatest demand is from high school, and um, that kind of makes a lot of sense because 18 is typically your threshold for you know, opening up credit cards and getting a car loan and things of that nature and um, student loans, right? And so uh, we do serve everyone, but we proactively prioritize economically vulnerable and underserved populations. And so um, our programs are taught by trained volunteers, um, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, the footings program that you see here 
Um, it's just a it's for our elementary school level. Framings is middle school, foundations is high school, and pathways um, is is that kind of blend between um, high school uh, junior seniors and then freshman sophomore of college. And so yeah, there we go. So uh, to give you an idea of kind of logistically what our approach looks like, um, so. Uh, we the hope is that finance beginnings with the programs managers and staff that will work with you is to make it to is for it to be a full kind of full service experience for you and so as i mentioned we we've already partnered with the los angeles public library network um where uh, at last count last fiscal year we're at five branches um we could definitely replicate that same model of course there are some nuanced differences as i mentioned but you as the library staff um, can request a class on our website um, or reach out to our program manager and I'll have her contact information towards the back end. Uh, her name is Teresa Giles. Uh, but once you submit that request or reach out via email to our program manager, um, then we start asking you um, some basic questions about where, when, who, um, kind of timing, who your audience is, things of that nature. Um, and then what happens thereafter is what we post it internally on our volunteer website. So volunteers who have, who have been trained, uh, who get our mailing um, list, and so we push that opportunity out to our volunteers um, and then uh, we find that match, that connection. And so um, I, at least with our experience with the LA uh, Public Library Network, we actually had some librarians who were like, hey, you know, this is stuff I'm truly passionate about and I will be the volunteer presenter. So uh, that's always an option for you all as well. Um, you can either do it yourself or someone on staff can lead it. And we, we do have a volunteer orientation um, that can uh, bring that individual up to speed on how to deliver the curriculum. Uh, but if, you, if there's no one or if there's no desire to have internal staff do it, again, we do have a network of volunteers uh, who would be ready to go on that as well. Um, so then uh, after the volunteers uh, receive the opportunity, well, they're gonna check their schedules and whatnot and then sign up for the class. Um, and then once that volunteer is, paired, is uh, paired for the class that you submitted uh, for, um, you'll be connected with them via an automated introductory email. Um, this email is an opportunity to introduce each other, share any pertinent details, the needs, the desires of your audience that relates to the topic, um, parking, things of that nature. What do you do? Do you check in first at a certain part, um, certain workstation of the library? And so then following the introductory email, uh, both the volunteer and you as the host will receive automated email reminders about the upcoming class uh, five days in advance and again one day in advance before that scheduled uh, workshop. Um, to organize all the logistics in one place, I, uh, we had created that content management system, that CMS that I mentioned earlier, um, and you'll actually again have access to that as an educator. Uh, where you'll see your class details, including the program uh, workshop name date time location and then who the volunteer is and their contact information as well as there too so basically you'll have the email connection but you'll also have the financial beginnings kind of uh, dashboard back end of it uh, to uh, get any information you need from the actual workshop or the presenter uh, student materials will be directly sent to your library site at least one week before the start of class so that you don't have to print out anything we have all the workbooks ready to go it just needs to be drop shipped to you um, uh, if you are doing a virtual delivery, um, we can also share electronic versions if that's uh, more preferred. Um, so here is, is kind of a, a way to uh, further kind of explain to you what your expect, uh, what the expectations are of you, I should say. Um, so you know, the biggest question we get is, well, what exactly is our role in all this as a host? And so. We, uh, we at Finance Beginnings really look to you for support before and during the program. So before the program, uh, I encourage you to uh, connect with whomever the volunteer presenter is um, ahead of time, share any relevant information with them, such as uh, you know, the people, the, the constituents you serve, or uh, if there's any kind of uniqueness that you need to kind of impart. Um, likewise, um, it all depends on how you coordinate the, the program at your level, but um, again, with the LA Library Network, um, we, we, we kind of experienced two different um, setups, I guess you could say. Uh, the one setup was uh, one librarian would schedule all this ahead of time, um, advertise it, uh, you know, leading up to it, uh, and then um, 
they would run around kind of the library and recruit people kind of a last minute approach as well. Um, others, they would schedule this ahead of time, but it was kind of bundled up in a life skill type of class. And so uh, more often than not, we would see the same uh, participants. Um, and we know it's challenging, right? Because um, it's not a requirement for anyone to go to the library. And so sometimes um, you might have one participant who comes for you know, budgeting, um, but if you have credit, they might not be there for that. And so it's okay to get it kind of a la carte piecemeal, that's fine. Um, and, and so uh, even with the volunteers, you can have the same volunteer each time uh, if their schedule permits, or you can have a different volunteer each time as well. So um, there's a lot of flexibility in that. Um, another thing that uh, it, you know, we, can, we can actually provide you with a flyer to help you spread the word um, within your library as well. Um, but lastly, uh, preparing that space. So um, whether you have some um, like a conference room or uh, what, what type of space you have, I don't know. <laughs> but if there's a space for that, um, you know, just basically helping us set that up. Um, and then uh, your volunteer uh, would essentially be delivering the program, of course. But um, we would hope that you can help introduce them, kind of how Brittany introduced me here um, at the beginning of that workshop, introduce the topic of the hand. Um, and really just help the volunteer set the student expectations. Uh, uh, we uh, we really lean on our host to kind of be that police enforcer, if you will, uh, for any behavioral issues. Um, and, and so we're really just kind of prepping our volunteers to present the content. Um, and then really our host knows the audience the best. Um, but, you know, that's kind of where you work day in and day out. So you kind of know the environment, the landscape much better than um, any of our volunteer or any of us. Um, so we really lean on you to help with kind of issues such as noise or disruptions. Um, and then lastly, we encourage you to just get familiar with the student workbooks um, uh, to just kind of flip through it, take a look at it. Uh, it's fully downloadable on our website, it's open source. So anyone can download it at no charge and just kind of flip through it um, and see uh, which content, which topic might work best uh, for you and your audience. And then during the program, um, again, just make that introduction for us if you can, um, just get that warm handoff, um, and then just kind of be there, like I said, to addressing unanticipated behavioral issues as well. So um, depending on how things will look from here on to the end of the year or into the next year, um, we do have the capability of delivering content virtually. Um, so we've had some community-based organizations that have uh, individuals all show up in person, um, and then uh, they're all given a computer workstation, um, and then um, you know they they give us kind of a latitude of hey, can we find a volunteer who can be there in person? Great, let's have that volunteer show up. Uh, if our volunteer um, is uh, able to do it, but can only do it virtually, then we kind of set that up. It all depends if you have a computer lab that can help facilitate this. If not then I think your best bet would just be an in-person engagement um, in that aspect. Okay. Uh, and so um, again, the program offerings here, uh, I'm gonna drill down a little bit more, but I think for maybe the audience that you work with, it can range from elementary to high school. Um, again, we do have a college program as well and an adult program too. So as I mentioned earlier, financial footings is just our internal way uh, or general, uh, uh, I guess, phrase that we created uh, to talk uh, about how, or, or really to present to the elementary school age. Um, we have uh, two steps. Um, step one is for kindergarten through second grade age group. Step two is for third through six. Um, the, the layout is different. Um, it's still four topics, but just for the younger ones in kindergarten through second grade, the contact time is a little bit shorter due to, you know, um, ability to stay engaged um, and attentive. <laughs> um, and then step two is for our third through sixth grade. So they have the more atten a larger attention span and they can typically go 45 minutes to one hour. Um, typically our sessions um, can go up to 90 minutes if you need it to. Um, uh, our curriculum was specifically designed for 90 minutes, um, but if you only have, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, um, we can still deliver it. It's just, it just means that we'll have to uh, cut, uh, look, look over uh, the things that we're gonna cut out basically. Um, again, for uh, those um, of you who maybe are still needing to do virtual delivery, 
or providing resources virtually. We do we do um, have a asynchronous learning platform that we created for our elementary school students. Uh, and uh, you know, if this is of interest, we can definitely uh, set you up with this. But basically, it's a lot of click and click and dragging. Um, and this activity here is identifying the currency and then the, the, the name of it. Uh, here's a, a, a screenshot of the curriculum that we have uh, on a PowerPoint. And so um, a lot of our programs um, are going through updates um, uh, uh, for our regular update schedule, at least. And so uh, we actually hired an in-house or in-house graphic designer that um, does all of our graphics, as you can see on the left slide there. Uh, but um, we're basically trying to move away from stock images as well. Uh, so our middle school program um, uh, is, is uh, essentially for uh, 45 minutes on. Um, typically, uh, we this this one is really more layered into the school level um, with like a social studies class or economics class um, because we we kind of as you can see here on, on the level two we talk about personal finance scenarios as it relates to a larger global economy. So. Um, our, our foundations program, which is typically our high school program, is can also be used for our middle school program um, as well. Um, and so, uh, as you look through the curriculum, you'll you'll see kind of there's there's these differences uh, between the, the student workbooks for our middle school level versus high school. Our middle school level is kind of more, um, I guess, macro, you could say, um, and and think about the kind of the way things work in this world and how the economy works and how all they're intertied together. Um, and then the high school level is, is kind of more of the, the practical uh, personal finance takeaways there. Okay. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the high school program at least can be a la carte. So uh, even though we have five different core areas, you might be saying, oh, I don't know, I don't have time for all five. Uh, I might only have time for one or two, and that's fine. And then we'll lean on you um, to kind of decide which of the topics uh, you feel might be more most relevant uh, for your audience. And so Foundations is one of the programs that we actually um, uh, upgraded and updated uh, within the last six months. Um, and so uh, the, our previous edition was going on uh, I want to say about five, uh, maybe three to five years old now, and it was really time for like kind of like a, a, a new look and feel. Um, so uh, we also redesigned the curriculum to be more learner centric. Um, our number one priority is to create learning materials and programming that really meets students at their level and shifts the focus of instruction from the presenter to the student. And so um, our, our program delivery is, is far different from what you're all experiencing here. You're, I'm just talking the whole time, right? Um, and so that's that's what we are advocate, are avidly steering away from. Um, we're not wanting that lecture base where someone just sits there and, and acts like a sponge and soaks it all up. And so we really built that out in our new uh, high school program here uh, to have the presenter be more of that facilitator and that communicator uh, versus that lecturer. Um, we've also uh, been very intentional about the look and feel of it. Um, uh, as well. And here you can see that we actually built out, um, it was formerly five modules. We've expanded out to 10. Uh, the topics still stay the same, budgeting, credit, investing, protection, and spending. Protection is like insurance and risk, basically. Um, and so we built it out where um, there's kind of a, a level one and a level two. Um, and so for example, let's take a look at credit here. So credit uh, level one, is, is always going to be laying the foundation. Just what are the principles of credit? Um, and then le level two is building the strategy. It's actually taking the concept that you learn in level one and applying it. Uh, and so that could that could be doing an activity such as you know buying a new smartphone or buying a car, um, just depending on what the topic is, or, or, or building a budget. Um, and so the what you see on the columns here, one, two, three, are just basically uh, the, the topics of uh, discussion for level one or level two. Okay. Um, the pathways, as I mentioned earlier, is, is kind of that hybrid between high school and college, um, simply because of the earlier modules like numbers one, two, uh, and maybe part of three. And so 
we typically layer this in at the school level with kind of the career and education path programs uh, that they may have. And so uh, they learn about kind of, um, you know, what, what career am I looking to or aspire to be in as I get older? Um, what schools am I looking at? How do I compare school and cost? And then three is um, determining, you know, how to fill out financial education forms to uh, pay for, help pay for college. Uh, four and five is typically for uh, our older college students um, as they learn about, um, you know, how to, how to manage all that student loan debt that they're accruing. Uh, and it could be they're getting subsidized loans or unsubsidized loans and the differences between those two. Um, and then graduation, understanding that there's typically a grace period, uh, provided that it is for um, a, a government a, a student a grant or a student loan um, and other things such as income-based repayments and what that might look like as well. So in terms of classroom delivery and quick check of time, we have about 20 minutes, but we're, we're nearly done. Um, there's, again, there's, it all depends on you. You'll, you'll have to let us know our financial beginnings, kind of the medium um, to deploy programs. Um, but typically um, it's 45 to 90 minutes um, and it can be done online via Zoom or uh, go to training, uh, or it could be done in person. Uh, we, uh, we provide PowerPoint presentations uh, that have been updated because of our uh, need to deliver virtually through uh, the current pandemic. Um, we also built out uh, resource kits um, if you need uh, to provide resources that are asynchronous. Uh, we built that out. Um, we have it in Google Classroom format. Uh, we've also built out recently our in-house learning management system too. Uh, so there's, those are different mediums um, for you as well. So um, again, you'll have to let us know. Typically what we hear is the preference for in-person delivery, right? And, and so that really is the model that Financial Beginnings has built our programs on, but understanding that um, there's different um, kind of states, I guess you could say, and desires um, from one, one location to another. Um, you, again, you'll have to let us know uh, which one is uh, of more interest, online or in person. Uh, and so then, if you want to do uh, online, uh, again, there, just as a reminder, there's there's two ways to do it. Um, you can head over to Financial Beginnings website, you can access your educator portal, um, and then you can select schedule a class. Uh, I always advocate the uh, email option because um, it's just easier. <laughs> it's just easier to talk to someone. So Carissa, um, again, whose contact information I will share uh, towards the end of this presentation, um, she has one of those kind of Calendly link in her email signature. And basically, um, you would just email her and say, hey, I'm interested um, in getting financial education programs into my library. Um, can we set up a time to talk? And then she'll respond and uh, provide that uh, link. And then basically it's connected to her schedule, her calendar. Um, and you can find a time slot that works best for you. Um, she's based in Nebraska, so she's on central time. So uh, one hour behind all of you there on Eastern. Okay, so the other thing is, well, what if I want to be the one who teaches material? That's perfectly fine. Uh, we would just have you uh, go through one of our volunteer orientations so that um, you get a deeper dive. This is, again, just scratching the surface of the program. So um, the volunteer orientation will go deeper into each of those, the components that make up a module, the resources and supplemental guides that come with it, um, and then a walkthrough on how to actually kind of uh, uh, present on those. Okay, so in terms of next steps, um, you know, just take some time to go through the Financial Beginnings website, um, take a look at the curriculum, um, the workbooks, the PowerPoints. Um, again, it's all open source. You just have to fill out your contact information to be able to download all of our curriculum. Um, and then from there, um, you know, decide if uh, there, there could be potential uh, partnership opportunities um, with our programs um, layered into your existing one or the, as a standalone. Again, um, you're, you're, the, you're, you're kind of the, the host in that sense and we'll follow your lead. Um, and then reach out to um, Carissa Giles, again, who's our program manager um, based out of Nebraska. Um, and so from there, uh, we can get the ball rolling uh, on any, uh, any financial education programs that uh, you think might benefit your community. And just as a last uh, kind of recap, um, the programs uh, are free. 
um, no cost to you or your audience. Um, it's all volunteer driven and presented, whether it be you or our trained volunteers. Uh, it can be delivered virtually or in person. Um, and then um, we do have uh, trained volunteers based out of Tampa. Um, and I know that might not be near some of you. And so um, if let's say you're based somewhere else in Florida where we don't have volunteers there, then um, again, there's that virtual delivery option or we hopefully can lean on you um, uh, to put up some flyers um, that we can provide for you to recruit volunteers. And then um, these flyers would basically just um, ch channel uh, pr perspective uh, you know, volunteers to go through financial beginnings programs so that you don't have to do any of the legwork. And again, uh, we're really following on the full service model so that you know, we make it easy for you to um, adopt our programs into your um, library. Uh, so with that said, um, that's it. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can feel free to type in the chat box. Or I think as Daryl mentioned, you can raise your hand and you can be unmuted. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, okay. oops, sorry. Um, oh, Brittany says, there's a question from someone who couldn't attend. Will any of the financial literacy courses be available in other languages, Spanish, Creole, or anything like that? Ah, yes, a uh, great question. Um, so we do have the Spanish um, program available for elementary and high school. So the, the footings level and then the foundations. And um, so essentially our foundations program can be used for middle school students. So we basically have uh, K through 12 spectrum um, covered for Spanish. We, we uh, Currently, we don't have it in any other languages, though. So. Okay, Ingrid asks, where can I find info about signing my middle school up for a class? Ah, oh, that'd be wonderful. Um, uh, if you just reach out to Carissa, um, it's going to be the easiest, the most efficient. Um, I typically try not to drive people to the website because uh, if it's your first time there, it's kind of hard to find things. And, and if you're looking at efficiency, I would just drop an email to Carissa, uh, as the email as you see on the screen, um, and then we can get that set up. And, and typically what that looks like is, um, you know, whether you're, I, I, I don't know if this person is a teacher or I'm not a teacher, <laughs> this person is a parent um, or just knows as family who works in the school system. But um, all you have to do is just provide that contact info of the, of the school staff and then we take it from there. Okay. Okay, not seeing anything else right a second, but like James said, um, if you have a question, you can use uh, the chat, you can raise your hand, I can unmute you. We're going to stick around for a little bit in case anybody's got any questions. Oh, one last thing I'll add, uh, even though I said last thing earlier, so <laughs> I'm excited to walk that back. Um, this is mm -hmm. probably the last thing I'll say. Uh, if you actually want to see how our program is being delivered, uh, we do have opportunities for you to kind of shadow and observe. But because you're based in Florida, um, where we don't have uh, in-person opportunities yet, um, you can't really do that. But we do have virtual opportunities. So uh, if you want to shadow to kind of see what our program looks like, um, Carissa can get you set up with that as well. Okay, I, I mean, I'm not seeing any more questions or any hand raises. Um, yeah, so, if, well, looks like we got a question. Um, Maya says, would you attend any information fairs or community fairs, or are the classes the only thing you have? Yeah, well, the, the biggest challenge we have is that um, we don't have a, a field office in Florida currently. And so a lot of the work that we do is uh, is, is through remote support, right? And so um, Carissa, for example, would be able to train any volunteer who, who lives in Florida, would be able to set up uh, opportunities for anyone in Florida. But in terms of um, actual physical attending, that, that would be a challenge for financial training staff. However, um, you know, maybe some of our volunteers are uh, able to do that on our behalf and, and provide um, you know, a workshop there or be able to talk uh, about financial gains, but typically, um, 
we we kind of just kind of do schools and community-based organizations because we don't have uh, individuals um, from the organization based in Florida yet. You're welcome. And then James, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, Karina says, uh, "Thank you very much. Very in depth and wonderfully explained." I oh, agree. Great. Thank you so much, Karina. I appreciate the feedback. And again, thanks for your time as well. Um, from my standpoint, I think collectively we can all uh, work together if there's an opportunity to do so to help increase financial knowledge um, in our communities. Okay, yeah, like we said, um, that concludes our webinar for the day, but we will be sticking around for a few more minutes to answer any questions. And as a reminder, this uh, recording this is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel very soon. Uh, Karina says there, uh, she said, I'm sure there is a high interest in a Spanish language session in for Florida in general. Um, and then Brittany says she has, or Brittany, oh, sorry, I was reading Karina's question. Um, Brittany says, uh, for someone who couldn't attend, would you know or be aware of any like type programs in the state of Hawaii? Oh, that's such a great question. Yeah, only because personally, I lived in Hawaii actually for a few years. And so it's, it's funny that this one came above. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of financial education, there's a lot of different community partners in general that offer something like this. Um, I, I don't know specifically if there are. I, I would probably refer them to jumpstart.org um, because that's this national coalition of community-based organizations that focus on the financial education efforts. And so I think that would be a good kind of first step. Um, similarly, I, I mean, uh, if, if there's an opportunity to do so, um, we could definitely provide remote support as well um, and uh, help out with those efforts. Okay, I think we can stick around for a couple more minutes if there's any other questions. Um, okay, so as we're wrapping up here, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you, James, for 
uh, taking the time out of your day to do this presentation and also to thank Carissa for helping with a lot of the presentation on the back end. Um, this was a fantastic webinar and I'm really glad that we had this opportunity to showcase this information to uh, Florida uh, library staff. And Karina says, in prior years, I have used the government website regarding financial education. And they do have a lot of activities as well. And it's perhaps something to look into as well. All right, that looks like um, about the last bit of the questions. Um, yeah, like I said, um, James said to get the website. Um, Chris's email is right here. Um, yeah, if you need to get in contact with James, Brittany, myself, um, you know, always feel free to reach out. Um, but with that, I. I I think we're done. Uh, James, Brittany, would you like to say anything else before we close it all out? Well, thank you all for the opportunity for this, and uh, we'll hope to hear from you soon. Yep, just want to reiterate the thank you for James uh, presenting and sharing all of this wonderful information, and for all of the attendees for coming to the webinar. So thank you. All right. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Uh, like I said, this will be on our YouTube pretty soon. So if you want to get the recording of that, you know, check there. And all right. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.